Well, you know, I, I heard a story of a, of a woman that came in the church. It was pretty full like today. And the usher uh, said, ma'am, uh, she said, I want to sit in the front. He says, I, I don't know if you want to sit in the front, ma'am. Why? The pastor's, the pastor's kind of boring. You might fall asleep. She goes, do you know who I am? He goes, no, I'm the pastor's mother. He goes, whoa. <laughs> and he said, to, he said to the woman, do you know who I am? She goes, no, good. And he walked away. <laughs> so... <laughs> I miss my mother telling me, I mean, I could bomb. I mean, I could tell a bad, I mean, I could do terrible. And she'd always find something good to say. And this is that video we saw before, being able to pick up the phone at any time and say, hey, mom, so can I just say something else? Will you cherish the relationships you have with your mom? Cherish the relationship you have with your family. Cherish the relationship you have with your children. Well, today we're, we're uh, continuing with our series, the question you asked about raising godly children in an ungodly world. How many of you would agree with me that raising kids today is a lot more difficult it was when you were growing up? Yeah. yeah. When I was growing up, I mean, it was kind of hard to be bad. Actually, it was kind of easy because my parents left me alone, right? I mean, <laughs> I, remember growing, I, mean I remember growing up, we just take off in the morning. You know what I'm talking about. Everyone would take off in the morning, and we wouldn't come back till the evening. My parents had no idea where I was. And if I misbehave, the, the, my friend's mother would spank me. That actually happened to me. And then she'd tell my mother, can you imagine doing that today? The police would be there. You'd have a bunch of lawyers. They'd be on CNN, C-SPAN. Anyhow, but that's kind of how we did it. We worked together. I, I heard people say this as well. I heard people say it takes a village to raise a child. And I heard someone also say, I would like to find out where that village is and drop off my children. <laughs> well, so... But anyhow, raising kids is, is, a real, uh, is a real treat, but a real difficult thing. And what do we do? It, it's, it's difficult today. I mean, when I was growing up, if I saw something on television, I'd have to be in the living room or I'd have to be someplace where there was a screen. We'd have to run home to see Steve Austin and the $6 million man. We had to run home to see The Fall Guy, not the new movie. We had to run home to see Planet of the Apes. And all this stuff's coming back, right? I remember coming back and being there at a certain time, we'd have to rush back. The whole family would come together. We'd watch Little House in the Prairie, and my mother would always cry because something always tragic happened, and the Little House in the Prairie was the most depressing. I mean, that's beside the point. We even watched Chips. I mean, remember those days? Yeah, you got, we watched Chips, and that's something you dip salsa in. It was actually a program. But we grew up on that kind of stuff, and we had family together. I remember one time uh, they had this thing called the Chiller the theater, which was a, like a Channel 11, WPIX, had a thing called Chiller Theater, and it was at night, and my brother, David, used to scare me. There used to be this chiller, and his hand would come up, chiller, and his hand would like this, and the guy had six fingers, and it freaked me out. I literally had nightmares, and that's because I saw something on the screen. What about today? You can see someone being shot, someone being beheaded. The kids can see all kinds of violence. They can see what's going on in the Gaza Strip. They can see all these horrific things taking place. And the kids see this. And how do you process all this stuff, right? How do you process all the images? How do you process all the bad news? How do you process someone bullying you? How do you process process trying to deal with all the other girls that are they're looking good and wearing nice things and you're trying to look good or how you supposed to process someone else doing an amazing in their life everything is going great your life is falling apart you have all this pressure to be a social media influencer how many likes do i have why does she have more likes than i have why is she going out with him and not me how come you got what happened here people saying stuff to you online and you hear all this pressure mounting 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 right and for a lot of the men and all that, there's pornography. I mean, I had to work hard when I was growing up to see something bad. And now it's right there at your fingertips. It's all around you. And now people are afraid to go out. You drive through a neighborhood today, it's a ghost town. There's tumbleweeds going through the neighborhood. No one's out. All the kids are home like this, talking to their friends. And they're afraid to go out. The parents are afraid to let the kids outside. I'd be out there with a big wheel in the middle of the road. I, I remember going to the Little League game in the back of a pickup truck, driving down the highway. I remember the kids playing ball outside. 
stopping cars and throwing rocks at cars. I mean, we were bad, but we were outside, right? Today, everyone's afraid. But, you know, what do we do? How do you raise kids God's way in an ungodly world? And so today, I, by no means am I a master at this. I'm still in process. The jury's still out on the kids. <laughs> but I'm believing God that they're going to serve God. I, can't, I will never force my children to believe in God because that's God's job. But I want to put them in a position where they can hear from God. I want to let them know that dad believes in God. So I want to encourage you today, how do we raise kids? Helping your children to know and love God. Let me just say something very important here. The best way leadership always begins with you and God first. And in the Old Testament, the Jewish would, people would at least read this twice a day. They'd recite this prayer over their household. And my, I suggest to you, it's a good place for us to begin. And here it is in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel... The Lord, the God, is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. That means everything inside of you, with all your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions, and with all your might, with all your strength. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. They gotta be on your heart. Not just talk about the faith, but you have to have God's word in your heart that you would not sin against God. And sin simply means missing the mark. I think all of us wanna hit the mark in life, don't we? And this is what the Bible says. And so this is what God calls for. So now watch the context of this. Parenting begins with letting God parenting you. And now we get to the next part. You shall teach them diligently to your children. Now, we have to understand that today, we mentioned this already, that the Western mindset of education is a lot different than it was in the East and in antiquity. In the time of the, Jew, of the Jewish people, they had something called apprenticeship. So what they would do is you'd spend time with your mentor or your rabbi, and the rabbi would spend time with you, would explain to you about how to do something. For example, Jesus told his disciples, this is how you preach. He'd preach, he'd lay hands on the sick, and they'd recover. He said, okay, guys, you watch me do it. Now, I want you to do it, and I'll be watching you. So they would, Jesus would have them do it. And he said, I want you now to go out on your own. They go out, and they come back and report to Jesus. So it was a hands-on. It wasn't just, in our culture today, if you could write an essay, if you can do a multiple choice, if you can do an oral argument that says the right things, you may not even believe what you're reporting or speaking about, but if you can regurgitate the information according to the standards of the professors, you can get a degree. And my friends, in the biblical understanding, it's not true knowledge until you can practice it. So we've lost that today, and so we just think information will change you. Information does not change you. Transformation changes you if you put the information in practice. And we divorced action from information too much in our culture today and even in the church. So teach them diligent to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit at your house, when you sit at the table. I'm going to pick on these because guess what? I struggle with it too. Can I be honest? I struggle with this too. I'm sitting there like this. It's amazing. I'm looking at nothing really bad, looking at cars or looking at the news story and looking at a funny meme about something. And the algorithm goes, let me send you another one. Let me send you another one. Let me I'm sitting there like this. I'm like a person in the, in the casino pulling the lever. All right? And 35 minutes goes by, and then your kids are right there. So it's very easy. We often model, don't look at your phone. I remember growing up and I had a friend named Sean. I can say it because I'm not gonna give you the last name. And his parents smoked. They were like chain smokers. They go like this. Hey, Sean, don't you guys ever smoke? <laughs> Honey, give me, a little, give me a light. And I don't know why they were like this. <sighs> don't ever smoke. So, you know, that's, so, you know, obviously, what kind of moral authority do you have when your kids tell your kids not to smoke, how about what kind of moral authority we have? We say, don't look at your phone. You look at your phone, right? And so is a phone a bad thing? Not necessarily, but what's bad about it is if it takes over relationships and there are people today that have no idea how to interact with people because they're always looking down and we don't see what's going on, right? And so God wants us to interact with each other and as a family, we have to learn to do that. So as we sit down in your house, 
Can I just tell you when you're eating dinner, put the phone away. Do I have to yell? It's not very effective, by the way, but it makes you feel like a man. Put the phone away. Anyhow. I'm sorry, guys. Okay. Uh, by the way, I've done that. Okay. Um, and then I pull my phone out. Okay. And, and when you walk, by the way, when you're in the car, talk to him when you're in the car about Jesus, about God, right? When you're walking in there and you see the clouds, like, look what God did with the birds. Look what God did. With, look, look at the aura out there with, because of the, sun, the solar storm. Look what God's done with the plants and, and acknowledge God in the little stuff that you see all around you, right? And when you lie down, tell them bedtime stories. That's the, I miss the bedtime stories. I'd be telling my child a story and I'd fall asleep and start talking gibberish. I said, Dad, 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 wow, you're falling asleep. Okay, I'm sorry. Oh, I miss those days. Anyhow, lie down and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your right hand. In other words, how do you live your life? Is your lifestyle righteous? Are you lying at the restaurant? Saying, your kid just turned 13. It's like $60 for an entree. It's like 10 bucks for the kid. He just turned last week. And the kid's like, Daddy, can I do it? I'm like, oh. I'm not going to tell you what I did. But seriously, if you, start, if you start negotiating that and you start showing your kid, it's okay to lie. Hey, tell him I'm not home. We get a phone call. You know, we can do this. And what happens, we're teaching our children to be dishonest. So binding upon your right hand, how you, how you act, and this shall be as frontless between your eyes. What are you looking at, right? What, what are the stuff you're looking at? I don't want you watching that. You're sitting there, and every other word in the movie you're watching is an expletive, right? Or you're sitting there watching all day long these newscasts that just lambast political candidates all day long, and all you hear about is negativity, negativity, and that's what your kids see. But you shall write them on the doorposts of your home and on your gates. In other words... We're not talking about information. We're talking about a, a Christ-centered home. How to raise your children God's way? You know how you do it, everybody? Do you love God with all your heart or some of your heart? I wish I could say my, my goal is 100%. Sometimes I wake up in the morning, I'm doing about 50%. By the time I brush my teeth and get a cup of coffee, I'm at 100%. <laughs> Then all of a sudden, I'm at 80%, right? But I'm always striving 100% God. You know what I notice? When I'm not living 100% for God, I get anxious, I get angry, I get frustrated, I get fearful. When I'm living my life completely for God, all that nonsense goes away. Isn't it wonderful? But we want to be this way. We want to love God with all of our hearts and our minds and our souls and our strength. We're not just going to quarantine God just for this is church and this is business. No, it all runs together. So listen, parents, uh, whatever you want to do, the best way to raise your children is to make sure that Christ is loving you and you're loving Christ. That's number one. The best way to heal your marriage is not for your spouse or your louse to change. The best way to heal your marriage is to be completely submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is how we change. And Joshua said this, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So we have an obligation, parents, to say, hey, this is our roost, <laughs> and we're going to serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You can speak it over your children. I speak it over my children, whether they like it or not. In Jesus' name, I declare that Luke, Hannah, and Matthew are going to follow God. I declare they're going to know God. They're going to supersede me and pass me in their life. They're probably feeling uncomfortable right now. That's not talking about us. But I'll, I'll, I'll speak it over their lives. I'm not going to force them. Because I know my Redeemer lives. I have a story of my upbringing. I have a story of my mother and how she, her parent, my grandparents were in a car accident. And my grandmother slammed against the dashboard. She's like 14 weeks pregnant. And they held hands and said, Father, if you save this child, we'll raise her your way. And my mother was born. My dad at the age of 16 was an was a orphan kid and going nowhere real fast. And at the age of 16, he had a vision of Jesus, and he heard Jesus say, David, I love you, and name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. My dad was 16. No one ever said to him, I love you, except for Jesus. That was the first person. He's 88 years old right now. He's never had an experience to that degree. It was an Apostle Paul experience. Tell the stories of your family. Tell the stories of your faith. Let your children know. Let your grandchildren know how you came to know Christ. It is the legacy of your faith. 
When I was doubting my faith, my dad's testimony stopped me from giving up and becoming an agnostic. What's an agnostic? We'll talk about that next week. So how do you raise, God's, raise children God's way? Do you love God with all your heart or some of your heart? And as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. In our house, we don't allow that. Now you're a little older and, you're, and your kids want to come with you on vacation and want to bring a boyfriend or girlfriend. Nope. Yeah, that's fine. We've got a separate room. But I don't care. You can sleep with them all you want. But under my house, we're doing it my way. If you don't like it, you can go your own way. You pay your own bill, pay your own vacation. But as far as long as you're in my house, this is my house. I have a right to determine what happens under my roof. You don't like it, go someplace else. Right? All right, that's what you do, okay? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We have a Christ-centered home or a culture Christian home. Now, a culture Christian home is like what's church is church, what's business is business. A culture Christian church home is pretty much like, I've done this too, well, we got to look good in front of everybody, right? We're going to go on Christmas and Easter. We'll go to certain days. But a Christ-centered home is this. Everything we do centers around Christ. What am I doing to help my family grow in Christ? Now, I wish I could say I was always perfect. This. I'm not. Okay? There's been many times that I had to apologize to my children for blowing it. <laughs> That's like every day. Okay? So seriously. So, but can I, can, I, can I meddle for a few moments? Can I, get on your, can I step on your toes just a little moment, a few moments? Okay? When I was growing up in, in the 1870s, okay, in our town, we had an Episcopal pastor, Presbyterian pastor, Catholic priest. We had um, uh, Baptists. We had uh, Pentecostal snake handlers. We had them all. And uh, they started doing sports on Sunday during church time. And so they, the, all the pastors got together, uh-uh, ain't going to happen here. You need to have it on Saturday or after two. So what do they do? They stopped. They changed it. And I had some friends of ours that moved out of here, went way down way down to the south, and they said that on Wednesday night, they're not allowed to have sports programs because they want the kids to go to youth group. It seems to me now, now it's your choice. It seems to me that, that everything else takes, takes precedence, play practice. What about putting, I'm not saying that church, listen, if you want to make a different, if you want to make another opportunity at home for your family, that's one thing. But why is it you bring your kids to the dentist, I hope. Your kids go to school, but why is church optional? I'm just asking the question. Okay, that's up to you. Listen, I know we, I'm not here to judge anybody because I don't know your story, you don't know mine. But I'm just asking you a question. It's always, tell, we're telling people, no, listen, you're in our house, you're going to our church. You're going to church. Why? Because it's important that, especially if you're younger, we want to do that. So are we a Christ-centered home or a cultural Christian home? Are we going to, when I blow it, am I going to be prideful and let days go by and not talk to Sandra? Or am I going to confess my sin to Sandra and we make up and we let our kids see us make up? And we kiss a little bit. Not too much, but we kiss a little bit when the kids are around. Let's just stop where we're at, okay? But, you know, we, the kids should see us make up. And, and we, we screw up, we tell them. Yeah, we screwed up, okay? So how to raise God's children? Love God with all your heart. Be a Christ-centered home. God should be at the center of our home. It was, his way is the best way, all right? It's such an important aspect. You see, children learn much more from the actions you display than from the words you convey. Can I, can I hear a holy ouch? It's true. We can say all we want. But they watch what you do. Do you ever see your kids do the same thing you do? And you get angry at them? And you get super angry at them because you're doing what you did? Am I the only? Okay, let's just move on. Okay. <laughs> Show and tell equals respect. You, you do it first, and then you tell them. That's respect. Tell and no show equals disrespect and rejection. You know what makes people leave the church more than anything else? Coming here on Sunday, oh, praise God, hallelujah, oh, God bless you, oh, oh, bless God. How you doing? I'm highly favored of God. I'm, oh, God is blessing me. I'm highly favored. Oh, I'm so good. I'm the head and not the tail. And you go home, you act like the devil, and the kids see that. The kids you see in church raising your hand, praise God, prophesying, telling people they're not raising their hand in church. Meanwhile, you go home and you raise your hand against your wife. You know what that will do? That will drive the children far away. And one thing I will say, my parents were real. 
You know, my, my dad was the same guy at home as he was in the pulpit, uh, except he was clothed, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and I hope I'm the same at home as I am in the pulpit. And sometimes I've even, I've even had a situation, I had to ask my wife to forgive me while I'm preaching. I've messed up. I've messed up a lot. I wish I could say I haven't, but I have. I believe that love covers a multitude of sins. In Mark 7, it talks about this. This people honor me with their lips, but the heart is far from me. Don't be a hypocrite. If you make a mistake, own it. Say, you know what? I was wrong. You can say, when's the last time you said to somebody you were wrong? If you can't remember, you got some issues that require a lot of tissues. Okay? So love God with all your heart. Be a Christ-centered home and pray daily for your children because the world is preying upon them. What does it mean? Why do I pray for? I love this quote from A.J. Gordon. I love it. It says this, you can, do, you can do more than pray after you have prayed, but you cannot do more than pray until you've prayed. Let that sink in. Huh? Yeah, I know. It takes a little bit of a, it's true. You can see praying for your kids. We prayed for our children before they were even born. We laid our hands on my wife and we prayed for her, prayed for under her womb for each of our children. When they, I remember when, when they were born, we cut the umbilical cord. Lord God, we get, these are not ours, they're yours. Lord, we give them back to you, right? We say, God, they're not my children, they're your children. Help me, Lord. So that's what you gotta do. So pray for your kids. Don't give up on prayer. Keep praying, keep going. I, I, I read about a woman that, that's pretty, uh, she, her name was Monica, and she had three children. She, was inter, she had to be forced into an arranged marriage, was not very good. Her husband was not a Christian at all. And uh, her oldest child was very intelligent, pretty much got high academic scholarships and was raising up in the, in the accolades of society. He became a, a, an intellectual, became a person that was a very good speaker. But what happened was he shocked up with some woman, got pregnant, out of wedlock, and he told his mother, I'm not interested in your religion. I don't car I'm sorry. And his mother had a dream. She said, I saw in a dream that you gave your life to Christ. I said, honey, mom, I don't want to follow God. He told her that. And then he went away and studied. He got involved with a cult, with a kind of a weird Christianity, which even Christianity came home, told his mother what he was doing. And his this is what his mother said to him. You're not welcome in my house, and I will not have a meal with you. I love you. You're my son, but you're not under my roof. So she, she basically said, I'll, today it's like, okay, come on home. Listen, sometimes you have to have tough love. I love you. You're my son. You're my daughter. But until you change your life, you're not under this roof. I'm, you, I'll always come to you. I'll always love you. But you're not a welcome under my house because you're not doing what, you're not honoring me by what you're doing. Whoa. Yeah, that's what she did. She kept praying for 17 years. 17 years. Finally, her husband came to Christ. And then one day she was praying and praying and praying. And by the way, Monica, she struggled with alcohol. Every once in a while, she'd go to the cellar and have too much to drink. And she felt like a hypocrite, but she kept praying. And the Lord dealt with her with her addiction to alcohol. And she got free of alcohol, but she kept praying and praying and praying. 17 years, one day, her son is sitting in a garden, and he hears a little boy say, pick up and read. And so he picks up a book and reads it. It's the Apostle Paul talking about how people that live this way were not inherited the kingdom of heaven. And at that very moment, he gave his life to Christ. And that man's name was St. Augustine. St. Augustine, one of the most monumental figures in church history, he wrote confessions, and he also wrote City of God. His writings influenced Martin Luther in the 1500s. An amazing man of God because his mother would not stop praying for him. Don't give up on your kids. Remember, you keep praying. What happens if nothing happens? Keep praying. Keep declaring in Jesus' name. Be careful what you speak. Listen, keep on praying. Keep on believing. Even, you don't even have to tell your kids anymore. She, she stopped bothering him. She kept praying for him and kept praying for him. Don't give up on praying. Here's my mother about a, a couple of years ago. I was going through my stuff, and this is what written in my Bible in 1980. It's what she wrote. Dear Eric, it's not my father, okay? He didn't have that kind of handwriting. She also put dad and mom, but it was mom. <laughs> Let's be honest. My dad's like, what'd you get for Christmas? Oh, <clears throat> we, we, we picked that out. 
Dear Eric, our prayer for you is that you may draw closer and closer to Jesus through reading his word. Guess what I do nearly every day? I read his word daily. My mother prayed that I would read his word daily and I would draw closer to God. The reason I'm on this stage is not because I'm up here for my ego. My mother said to me that you will read the word and she prophesied over me. You'll get closer to him. And I'm a result of that today. I have it right here in writing, right? That you would draw closer and closer to Jesus through reading his word. We are so thankful for you. And know you will serve him because he told us so when you were born, prophesying on me. Love you all, love you so much. I mean, the powerful prayers of a mother. Tell your children. Speak life over them. I've been guilty of speaking death over my kids at times, not even realizing it. Saying, oh, don't do that, you'll be this. If you do that, you'll be a loser. Don't do that, you'll be a loser. And so what are the kids here? You're a loser, you're a loser. You're saying don't do it to be a loser, and all of a sudden your kid thinks, I'm just a loser. And then you find out later on, and you realize that some of the words you've said has hurt your child, and, and, and what makes it worse, instead of being something to be an impetus for them to move and to do something, it discourages them. You know how that's happened to me. I've said things to my children that I, I, I meant well, but I actually hurt them, and it broke my heart. I literally cried, and I had to ask for forgiveness. We don't realize, you see, Satan's out there. He does it all the time. When you're married, you say, honey, I'll be home later. Or, or maybe you say, I'm sorry about that. And he goes, he's not really sorry. Don't be a loser. He says, you're a loser. Thank you. <laughs> Is that Siri? <laughs> For those who did not hear it, <laughs> I said, you're a loser. And Siri said, that's not nice. Give it for Siri. Come on. I also believe, according to the book of uh, Revelation, the Bible says that God collects prayers in gold bowls. Now, does he literally collect them in gold bowls? It's symbolic that your prayers are like incense to the Lord. We used to go to a, a, an amusement park, Quasi and others, and there'd be a little, like a big bucket in a water park. Ding, 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 ding. And the thing would be filled with water. And all of a sudden, it would start shaking. And the next thing you know, it got so full of water, it would spill over you and get you all wet with all that bacteria-laden water would go over you. <laughs> I'm convinced, my friends, don't give up on prayer. I don't understand it completely, but God works through prayer. Keep on praying for your kids. I don't care how old they are. Keep praying for your parents. Keep praying for your children. Don't give up. Do you realize that the prayers of my mother are still in heaven even though she's not here anymore because she put them in the bank? My grandparents prayed for me, and their prayers are coming to pass right now. Abraham prayed, and his, his things are happening right now in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. So don't give up on prayer. It's powerful. Don't give up on prayer. Pray for your children. Pray for your grandchildren. Pray for your kids' kids. Do it ahead of time. Believe God for it. Now, it says in Proverbs, train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he's old, he would not depart from it. Well, I heard scholars say, well, you know, you really can't believe that. That's more of a principle than a promise. And they're right. It's more of a principle. But why not declare it in faith? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I'm not going to say, well, maybe they won't. No. As far as I'm concerned, they're going to serve God. And I'm going to battle to hell and back that they will serve the Lord. I don't know what they're going to do, but I pray for that, right? Train up a child in the way he should go. And the word train there actually means to initiate dedicate or train and it, it takes time for this you know one of the frustrations i do have I, I since my eyes are not as good as they used to be i read my bible a lot on this so they probably think i'm on my phone i said i'm reading my bible sure you are dad <laughs> honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the lord your god has given you this is the ten commandments so parents you need to honor your parents. 
What happens if your parents were dishonorable? And believe me, there's a lot are dishonorable. You can still honor them, but if they're messing up your life, you can honor them and honor them by not having them in your life as well. But you still need to honor them. Take care of them. Maybe sacrifice a little. To just throw them into some kind of kennel someplace. Unheard of what happens in America. You go to Japan and other places in the world, they never they don't do this. You go to Italy, they don't do this in Italy. They, families take care of their families. Here, they throw them to the kennel. You know what will happen one day to you? They'll throw you to the kennel. What's the kennel? Listen, I know there's some good nursing homes out there, and I understand sometimes you need that. Listen, I'm not making you feel bad. Okay, sometimes it's necessary, but I'm telling you, we just discard the elderly. We treat them like they're nothing. We make fun of them. They've worked hard all of their lives. The Bible says, honor your father and mother that it may go well with you. So if you don't honor your mother and father, and your kids see that, by the way, and you get old, well, they kind of threw mom the... They kind of push mom off the cliff, so let's do the same to her. <laughs> you know, is that what's going to happen? No, we, we need to honor it. And so what does honor mean? And so less rules, main rules to honor. Now, I haven't got this down straight yet, but I like this, where instead of saving all these rules, I want you to honor your mother. When she says something, you do what she says. Rather than do all these rules, hey, did you honor your mother? She told you to clean your room. I didn't do it. You're not honoring your mother. You're not honoring, you're not giving her respect. You see that, everybody? So rather than do all these rules, just focus on honoring. Honor your mother, how you speak to her. Honor what you say about her. Hey, don't raise your, don't raise your voice at your mother like that. Don't speak, that's, not, that's being dishonoring. Honor your father, honor your mother. You see that, everybody? You basically treat them with respect. So what does that mean? Isn't that a lot better? Because otherwise, you're doing this. The goal of discipline is to make a person better, while punishment makes kids care more about not getting caught. How far can I go before I get in trouble rather than live an honorful life? Now, I wish I could say I've always done this, but something I'm focusing a lot more on is having less rules and tell them to honor, honor God and honor each other. Now, there's different ways to discipline based upon the stages of life. Let me explain. From zero to five, this is called the discipline years. The the uh, neuroplasticity of a baby is extraordinary from zero to five. The, the cement is so wet. It is a critical time in the development of the child. Make sure that whoever's giving in to your child is doing the right thing. May I tell you, it's important. Okay, and at this point, there's no negotiations. Do not touch the stove. Do not do this. Yes, no. They don't need to discuss it with anybody. That's why if a child is zero to five, don't tell the child, well, you might be a boy, you might be a girl, you might be a they, you might be a, you might be a, I don't know. You know what that is? Child abuse. That is evil and it's wicked and we should fight against it within our towns, within our school board. Don't let someone, what does a child know? My brother thought he was adopted for five years. My brother said it. If you told me an alien is going to come and extract me from the earth and take me someplace else, I have a four-year-old, I believe you. That's child abuse. That's, let me tell you, that's, now listen, the people, I know they're try, there are people out there that are doing this type of stuff. Some of them really think they're trying to do something good. They're, it's an evil presence that has diluted their thoughts. It's wrong, and we have an obligation to protect our children in our towns, in our school systems, within the legal system, within the political system of our country. We stay with Jesus. We stay with God. But we talk about policy, not politicians. Discipline years, zero to five. Now, that's the first part. You tell them what to do, hot, cold, okay? Then we come to the training years. Now, we tell them why, and it's a pain. Why is the sky black? Why is it, you know, so training years, I want you to put that away. Why do I have to make my bed? Because your mother will kill me if you don't. (laughs) Okay, training years, why? Why do I have to do this? Why do I have to have green beans? Why can't I have Pop-Tarts and Frosted Flakes and Captain Crunch three times a day? Because you'll be a diabetic. 
and you're going to rip the roof of her mouth because the Cap'n Crunch does that. <laughs> and then when you have the orange juice, you're like, ah! Oh, yeah. I was not allowed to have Cap'n Crunch as a child. But when I went to my grandma's house, I had Cap'n Crunch. <laughs> and I had, this is a little bit controversial, okay? I had peanut butter Cap'n Crunch. <laughs> and when I was growing up, we had peanut butter sandwiches in school. You can bring pot to school, but don't you dare bring peanut butter. <laughs> so you have the training years, 5 to 12, and you tell the kids why, right? Rules without relationship equals rebellion. Josh McDowell said it a number of years ago. I've never forgotten it. Rules without relationship equals rebellion. You have to tell the kids why. And sometimes you're like, well, it doesn't make much sense, does it? No. Why? Why does God allow evil in the world? Tell them. I don't know the answer. Well, I don't know. The, just find out. Have open dialogue. Talk to them. Then we go zero to zero, five to 12. Then we get to this part, coaching years. It's like being a coach in baseball or soccer. Now you're helping the kids to do it on their own. Right? You don't have to cut their meat anymore at this point. Okay? Coaching them. Hopefully get them on their own to 18. And then I don't want my kids seeing this part because for my kids, it's 25. But for the rest of you, it's 18. <laughs> then we have the friendship years. Now we're friends. Unless you're into my house. I'm paying your car insurance. Health insurance. You don't like it, you can move out and pay your own bills. And you, you know, pay your own bills and take your own pills. But when you're in my house, does that make sense? So we want to move from disciple, uh, discipline years to the training years to the coaching years to the friendship. You Hopefully, they'll want to be around you. You guys still want to be around me? Okay. So love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, your mind, your strength. That's number one for parenting. If that, nothing else works, all right? Be Christ-centered at home. Make it all about Jesus. Pray daily for your children. Don't give up on prayer, even if you don't see any kind of reaction, and train them up in the right way to go. You see, who and what you expose your children to will shape who they become and what they believe. Watch the friends they hang out with. Behavior is communicable. It really is. Hang out with an angry man, you'll hang angry. Watch who they're hanging out with. It's very important, and what you expose your kids to. It's so, everyone has their own TV in there, and now they can watch, I don't know what, it's so hard. Isn't that hard, everybody? And you don't want to fill your mind with trash, trash in, trash out. What entertains you, drains you. And so you're watching things about people sleeping around and swearing and killing each other and treating life like nothing. It's not good. And the problem is I can't keep up with the technology. They're, they're way ahead of me. So we need to have a class on how to deal with this stuff. Okay, that's another time. Expose children to the joy of knowing God. Let them see you worship God. And expose children to the presence and power of God and his church. Let them go to our meetings where people are being prayed for. Let them go to places of prayer. Let, take them to Christian camps with you. But let them be exposed to it and let them know that church people are messed up like, like we are. God's perfect church people are not. Let them know that. Let them know the church will disappoint them, but God won't. Well, how can you, why do you go? Because you disappoint me too. We're all a work in progress. Let them know that God will never fail. People do fail. See, those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Are your children planted in the house of the Lord? Help them to flourish. Let's pray. Father, in the matchless name of Jesus, Lord, I wish... We had this all down perfect. But Father, we thank you that you do not leave us alone in our parenting. You teach us what it means to be a good parent, that children are a gift from you. Blessed whose man is quiver is full of them. And Father, like a choice arrow, that we would fire our children into their destinies. Father, I pray for those right now that feel awful. Those people that, Lord, all of us in this room, if we're really honest, have blown it in our parenting skills. Lord, we've made a lot of mistakes, and we thank you. There's no, therefore no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And what the enemy meant for evil, you can turn to good. Father, I pray that today would be a new day. Father, I pray that even phone calls would happen today. And apologies would be given, Father God. And people taking, taking um, responsibility for what they've done. And Father, we pray for your grace and your mercy. And we thank you, Father, we can entrust our children to you, that you love our children 
more than we do. Lord, we ask in this place we would see godly boys and girls become godly teenagers, become godly young adults, godly families, godly grandparents. Lord, we pray for the multiple generations to rise in this place from the, from the womb all the way to the end of life. Lord, we're asking for a chain of multi-generations working together where the elderly appreciate the younger, where the younger appreciate the elderly. And Lord, that we would be one. We would not be fighting against each other, but instead we'd be encouraging each other, blessing each other, taking care of each other. Lord, we pray that children and teenagers would go to homes of people that are elderly and help them clean their homes. And Father, we would see the elderly encouraging young children, telling the stories of how you got them through the storms of their life. And Father, that we become better together. Lord, we declare this is a multi-generational church where we honor you above all else, oh God. We pray for strong families in this place, strong marriages, Father. People would know their destiny in Christ and be released, Father. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and Cornerstone Church, we will serve the Lord in this place, in Jesus' name. We declare healthy families in Jesus' name. We declare marriages to be healed in Jesus' name. We declare sexual identities to be hope healed in Jesus' name. Father, we're praying for marriages to be strong, kids to be strong, addictions to break off. Destiny would be spoken to in their lives in Jesus' name. We speak blessing on multi-generations in this place in Jesus' name. Father, I ask for an equipping upon the parents. And we want to re repeat once again, there's therefore no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Father, if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Father, we thank it also says that we are to confess our sins to one another and pray for each other that we would be healed. Father, we pray that we'd be healing across this place. That we take off the mask, we begin to be real, and we see mentoring taking place organically in this place. In Jesus' name we pray.